Greetings, fellow Freethinkers. The event you're about to watch was hosted by the Center for Inquiry, an educational and outreach organization dedicated to defending and promoting science, reason, secularism, and free inquiry in every area of human endeavor. My name is Justin Trasse, and as Executive Director of CFI Canada, I would like to take a moment to tell you a bit about us. CFI Canada currently incorporates CFI Communities for Inquiry in Calgary, Montreal, and Vancouver over 30 affiliated student organizations from coast to coast, and of course our headquarters here at the Centre for Inquiry Ontario. CFI Ontario, located in the heart of downtown Toronto, is the first Canadian branch of CFI and is the first dedicated event and meeting space for all humanists, skeptics, and freethinkers in the nation. Our mandate encompasses a robust public education series, campus outreach to a growing network of student freethought groups, community outreach and social services, to provide secular and humanist alternatives to religiously monopolized services and activities, and a lending library and media center that, among other things, broadcasts videos like this across the planet. To learn more, please visit us at www.cfiontario.org. To get on our email list or to learn how you can support our movement, such as by becoming a friend of the center, a CFI donor, a volunteer, or to launch or affiliate a new campus or local group, contact us today at Ontario at centerforinquiry.net. That's C-E-N-T-E-R. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the video. So tonight I want to invite, uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Larry Beinhart. He's an American author. Uh, you, probably most people that I've ran into, they know him most for uh, the book that he wrote, American Hero, which was adapted into the, the popular movie Wag. Wag the Dog. Uh, he also won uh, an Edgar Award for No One Rides for Free. And I think this is his eighth book that he's written. Uh, so he's here tonight to talk to us about that. And it sounds like an interesting book with lots of uh, different religions kind of put into it. I'm sure he'll tell you all about that. So I would like you all to help me in welcoming Larry Bonaparte. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here, and it's a pleasure to be in Toronto. Um, this is the new book, it's called Salvation Boulevard. Um, the pitch meeting summary of it, uh, anybody doesn't know what a pitch meeting is, that's a description of um, how you summarize something when you try to sell it in Hollywood, so that they'll make a movie of it. The pitch meeting summary of the book is, the corpse is an atheist professor, the accused is an Islamic foreign student, the defense attorney is a Jewish lawyer, the investigator is a born-again Christian, and the mystery is God. Um, and uh, I write mystery novels for the most part, occasionally um, a non-fiction book. And, um, the great thing about a mystery is that if you kill somebody on the first page and then shortly promise the reader that you'll tell them who did it on the last page, they will read all the way through no matter what else you do. And this gives you an opportunity to write about whatever it is that you happen to want to write about. Um, Dick Francis, for example, has written I think 22 books now about steeplechase racing. Um, I have no interest in steeplechase reading, racing, but I have read at least 20 of the 22. Um, of course he kills somebody on the first page and then tells me who did it on the last one. Um, and so what I do basically is um, I wait for the bank to tell me you have no money. And then I say, okay, what am I interested in enough? to spend the next year or two writing a book about. And in this case, um, it seemed to me that the entire world was having a bad acid flashback of the 12th century. And here we are with jihads and holy wars and um, up until, well, up until January 12th, I think, or 11th of next year, the United States controlled by um, a religious movement, which is a pretty astounding turn of events. And it seemed to me that this should have been 
should have become the leading topic of conversation, of our public dialogue. And it isn't. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see um, massive federal grants going to uh, why do people believe in God so much that they're willing to kill and die for it? Seems like a reasonably important question. Um, it seems like it should be part of the Defense Department budget or part of the Homeland Security budget or, or something. Um, it seems like it should be um, a major portion of our, di uh, our dialogue in the public square on television, newspapers, radio, what have you. And it isn't. Um, so I said, okay, um, I'll put my two cents in here and see if I can make a living doing it. Um, and the fundamental question, and it's, a question, and it's a question oddly enough that I don't think Dawkins answered, which I kind of expected him to. Um, I didn't expect Harris or, uh, to do it. And it's a question that none of not classical atheism doesn't really answer is why would people believe in something that is non-existent? And if they do so, why is that not dysfunctional? Now, I know plenty of people, you know, delusion sort of by definition should be dysfunctional. Most people we know who are deluded are dysfunctional. Uh, I know plenty of people who believe in God, fervently or less fervently, who are happier and more successful and make a lot more money than I do. And how can that be since they're deluded and I'm not? You know, it's not fair. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would really, I have, I have a fantasy in which I become an evangelical atheist and people tithe to me. Um, you know, it's a niche that nobody's managed to fill. Uh, but I, I haven't made the leap to, to what, what can make atheism quite so appealing. Um, but any, but what I could do um, is I like to write about things that I can't find somewhere else. If somebody else wrote it, they say, oh, that's fine, that's the answer, and I don't, I don't have to deal with that. And so I try to figure out why it is that um, people believe in God so fervently, and also why it's not dysfunctional. And so I have a theory, and there you are, so I'll share it with you. Um, and it is this, that our number one need is to figure out what the world means in relationship to ourselves. This comes ahead of food, safety, sex, or anything else. If we cannot figure out what the world means in relationship to ourselves, we will try to eat stones, we will walk off cliffs, and procreate with porcupines. And none of that will be will be successful. So, so even before you do anything else, you have to figure out what the world means in relationship to yourself. If at any point that you cannot do that, you become completely dysfunctional. Um, so, the way human beings are structured is that. Um, we have chemistry that prompts our needs. And it, when we need something, it arouses you. You know, it says, oh, why don't you go to the refrigerator and get some haagen because you're hungry. And I assume you have haagen here, right? Yeah, okay. Um, didn't want to make a wrong cultural reference. Anyway, um, and you go to the refrigerator and it's empty and you're feeling lazy, so you sit back down and then your body drips a little more chemicals into you and you have to pay attention and it keeps doing that until you pay attention and do something about it. Um, and this happens with any need, whether it's for safety or sex or um, shelter or um, whatever you can think of. And your body will keep doing it until you satisfy that need. All right. 